Shabbat Shalom, everybody. To those of you here present, and for those of you who are joining us uh, online, I welcome you. Needless to say that we are all witnessing history unfold before our very eyes. The 70-year peace across Europe has been shattered. Chaos has erupted. Peril, fear has fallen on, upon a country of people who did not deserve war. And all because a tyrant, power-hungry, who sees his life through the lens of what was and what he believes he can rebuild, has decided to invade Ukraine. Now, there's nothing I can say to you today that probably hasn't already been covered by most of the great pundits. I'm not even going to attempt that. Certainly, I'm not going to get involved in the geopolitical impact of what's gone on because there are people far more knowledgeable than myself that are speaking on it, have written on it. Two very good articles in this morning's Montreal Gazette, if you haven't had a chance to read it yet, so that's not what I'm going to do this morning. What I want to look at for the next few minutes is what does the current situation mean for the 200,000 Jews in Ukraine? And what does it mean for Israel? Now, Ukraine has a long and complicated history with the Jews. Jews have lived in Ukraine since antiquity. Roman-era Jewish artifacts have been found in Ukraine. 1,500 years ago, the elite of the kingdom of the Khazars, which was located in eastern Ukraine, legendarily converted to Judaism. Ukraine was an important center in the Pale of Settlement, the region of the Russian Empire where Jews were allowed to live. And many of the most revered figures of early Hasidic Judaism, including Dov Ber, also known as the Magid of Mezrich, the Breslov Rebbe, known as Rebbe Nachman, was active in Ukraine. Tens of thousands of Reb Nachman's followers continue to make pilgrimages to his gravesite in Ukraine every Rosh Hashanah. Bodan Kalmanitsky is remembered by Ukrainians as a national hi hero, a Cossack who liberated Ukraine from Poland in the 17th century. A city and region bear his name, and his face can be found on Ukraine's currency. And there is a memento statue of him right in the center of Kiev. Yet, Jews remember Khalmanitsky for his rabid and virulent anti-Semitism. He orchestrated the revolt against Poland on the basis that the Poles had sold them as slaves into the hands of the accursed Jews. Kalmanitsky launched a pogrom that totally destroyed 300 Jewish communities. About half of the Jewish population was either murdered or taken away as captive. Atrocity stories about the horrible things his soldiers did to the Jews spread throughout Europe and are recorded. This week's Torah portion, Pasha Vayakel, 
contains allusions to why people have often hated the Jews. It's op it opens with Moses gathering the entire community together and reiterating the commandment to observe Shabbat. We have our own unique customs, such as observing Shabbat, as well as keeping kosher and praying in an ancient language. It's pretty easy to see that we're different. We are other and we are proud of it. We're not just like everyone else. And you know what, as much as some Jews try to make themselves like everyone else, ultimately, for the tyrants and the despots, you'll always be a Jew. This week's parasha also contains very precise and exacting details for how things were to be done in constructing the tabernacle. We discussed it the whole week every morning during services. I imagine the Jewish attention to details such as these, or details such as what we will or will not do on the Shabbat, and we will or will or, not or won't eat, etc., etc., can be mystifying and perhaps even a little frightening to some Jews. I see it all the time. I have people who are going through conversion, and I say to them, well, what does your mother, what does your father think about you converting to Judaism? And they'll say, well, you know, they're a little scared. They're, they're, they're scared that I'm going to change things, or I won't be able to, or, or they won't be able to do things with me or for me. It can be mystifying to non-Jews. I get it. Additional reasons for us to be pegged as dangerous outsiders. And while there is still some anti-Semitism to be found in Ukraine, it's also true that the president of Ukraine, Vladimir Zelensky, is Jewish. And what's more, he won with an impressive 73% of the vote. Anti-Semitism may be present in Ukraine, but I don't know if you can describe it today as a major problem. If a Jew can be elected president with an overwhelming majority, I would say it's Nishka Ferlach. Yeah, it exists, but you know what? Not so much. And Zelensky is not a one-off. Several other Jews have been elected to high office since Ukraine obtained its independence from the Soviet Union. Anti-Semitism might not be a big problem in Ukraine, but that didn't stop Putin from trying to use anti-Semitism as a PR tool. Back in 2014, you might remember when Russia invaded and then annexed the Crimean Peninsula, the Russians tried playing the anti-Semitism card. The Kremlin claimed that the Ukrainian revolution in 2014, which saw the ouster of Viktor Yanukovych, was displaying Ukrainian neo-Nazism, fascism, and anti-Semitism. What, all of a sudden, the Russians are so concerned about anti-Semitism that they're going to go invade another country to protect the Jews? Did this for the world to see. Putin even claimed that the destruction of Orthodox churches and synagogues was a reason for Russian troops to be present in the Crimea, to protect them. Is there any one problem with that? That there was actually no such destruction of either churches or synagogues in the Crimean Peninsula. The revolution was also known as the Maiden Revolution, after a famous city and the square where some of the conflict played out. Alexander Prokhanov, editor of a far-right Russian newspaper, and therefore a huge fan and supporter of Putin, said, I'm especially astonished by the Jews and all the Jewish organizations that support this Maiden. Don't they understand that they are helping bring on a second holocaust? 
the perpetrators of this second holocaust elected a Jew, a Jew president with an overwhelming majority. I don't think that would have happened in Nazi Germany. Could be wrong, but I don't believe so. Oh, hold on a second, wait. Once Hitler was elected, there were no more free elections in Nazi Germany. The truth is, anti-Semitism is not a big problem in either Ukraine or Russia. Sociological studies show the two countries have similar levels of anti-Semitism, and that, that level is much lower than the level of anti-Semitism found in France and in Austria. Putin's talk of anti-Semitism is nothing more than propaganda. He's using the Jews. Nothing more than that. The Jews in Ukraine are worried, but they're not worried about anti-Semitism. They're worried about the dangers of war. Rabbi Yaakov Blech, one of several rabbis who claim themselves to be the chief rabbi of Ukraine. I've never seen such a small country with so many chief rabbis. They all, so many of them claim themselves chief rabbis. He said, Jews are part of the general community here. What's good for Ukraine is good for the Jews of Ukraine. What's bad for Ukraine is bad for the Jews of Ukraine. He also said, Russia's acts are acts of war against the sovereignty of Ukraine. Now, the Jewish community in Ukraine is not worried about anti-Semitism in the wake of the Russian invasion. They are worried about the same things that every other Ukrainian is worried about. The dangers of living in a war zone. Jews in the east and south of Ukraine are the ones of, where are in the most potential sort of line of fire. But they're largely not going anywhere. You know, a rabbi in Kiev, when he was interviewed, said, and clearly it's proved to be wrong, but he said that he didn't think Kiev would be subject to a ground invasion. Well, we know that now, that's not the case. But he was worried that Russian missiles and bombs might hit targets such as the Ministry of Defense that are located in Kiev. Now, unlike most other Ukrainians, the Jews in Ukraine do have an option if things get beyond bearable for them. And that is, of course, they can leave for Israel. The Israeli government has already prepared plans to evacuate Jews from the Ukraine. Now, of course, they knew very well that the first things to go down would be the airports. And, of course, that's what happened. So they made arrangements to bring Jews out overland through neighboring countries such as Poland or Belarus. One of the local rabbis, however, said that he didn't expect a big wave of Jews leaving for Israel because of a possible invasion. He said that they didn't leave when things got bad in 2014 and they're certainly not gonna leave now. But they are preparing for very difficult times. The Jewish community in Odessa has spent over $300,000 preparing supplies in places where Jews can flee to to shelter in the event of, an inv of, of the invasion, of a ground invasion. Meanwhile, the state of Israel has officially been what one would consider somewhat restrained in its response of the, of, of the invasion into Ukraine. Sadly, it even chose to cancel the sale of the Iron Dome system to Ukraine. And even though the US and the most Western countries have condemned Russia's act, acts in incredibly strong terms, including imposing sanctions, all Israel has done this far is sort of a tepid statement saying that it supports Ukraine's territorial integrity, etc., etc., etc. It did make another statement on Thursday, I believe. And the statement was very careful not to mention too much about Russia. Israel has a very complex geopolitical considerations at play here. 
One of Israel's biggest priorities is to stop Hezbollah from getting advanced weapons from Iran. Israel can only attack convoys carrying weapons through Syria with Russian permission. If Israel angers Russia, the Israeli Air Force will no longer have freedom of action in Syria, and Hezbollah could be receiving many more advanced missiles and other weapons from Iran. What was very interesting is that a foreign ministry spokesman did, however, say that if Israel were forced to choose between America and Russia, it would clearly choose America. Which immediately caused a response from Russia, I don't know if you followed this, bringing into question the right of Israel's sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Now, that might seem to the average person as being you know, sort of a tit for tat, but that is a very, very serious statement. Because what that does is, for those who read between the lines, that would be signaling that Russia is about to protect Assad Syria, and that perhaps if Israel doesn't fall into line behind the Russians, he will support a war between Syria and Israel to get the Golan Heights back. I think it would be a great mistake, and I, I'm hoping it was just nothing more than rhetoric, but who knows? With Putin, you can never tell, because the unthinkable has already happened. There isn't a lot that we can do to help our brethren in the Ukraine right now. As you well know, because as I mentioned earlier, there are organizations raising money to help the community defray the expenses of working through this invasion and what that is going to look like for the communities. And I urge each and every one of you to do what you can to help by donating to what I call legitimate organizations. We've got it here, either through the shore or through federation. But there is one other thing we can also do, and that, of course, is offer our prayers. And therefore, I just want you to rise for a moment as I offer a special prayer at this time. Ribbono shel olam, master of the universe, please, please guide the leaders of Russia, Ukraine, and other nations with the wisdom to find a peaceful resolution to this conflict. Even though hostilities have already broken out, we beg you, dear Lord, keep our brothers and sisters in Ukraine and all Ukrainians, including its heroic president, safe from harm. And may we soon see the day when nation does not lift up sword against nation and mankind will not learn war anymore. Amen.